Mr. President, for the last few weeks, I've been listening to the Republican leader ask the majority leader not to turn the United States Senate into a place where a majority of 51 can do anything it wants. And I'm on the floor to, today to suggest three reasons why I believe the majority leader will not do that. Number one, he said he wouldn't. He said he wouldn't. And senators keep their word. Number two, in 2007, the majority leader said to do so would be the end of the Senate. There haven't been many majority leaders in the history of the Senate, and I know none of them want to have written on their tombstone, he presided over the end of the United States Senate. And third, the majority leader is an able and experienced legislator. And he knows that if Democrats find a way to use 51 votes to do anything they want to do, it won't be very long till Republicans find a way, if we're in the majority, to use 51 votes to do whatever we want to do. So let me take those three reasons one by one. First, the majority leader has given his word. The Republican leader mentioned that. At the beginning of the last two Congresses, at the request of the Republican leader, I worked with several Democrats and Republicans to change the rules of the Senate to make it work better, and we succeeded in that. We talked about it, negotiated, and we voted those changes through. We eliminated the secret hold. We abolished 169 Senate-confirmed positions. We expedited 273 more. We reduced the time to confirm uh, district judges. We made it easier to go to conference, and in exchange for all that, the majority leader said he would not support changes in the rules in this two-year session of Congress except through the regular order. He said, the minority leader and I have discussed this on numerous occasions. This is the Demo the Democratic leader. The proper way to change the Senate rules is through the procedures established in the rules, and I'll oppose any effort in Congress or the next to change the Senate rules other than through the regular order. I'd like to ask consent to include, following my remarks, the majority leader's comments. Without objection. Second, Mr. President, I was a new senator 10 years ago in 2003. I was absolutely infuriated by what the Democrats did in the first few months. And for the first time in history, they used the filibuster to deny a president's judicial nominations for the circuit courts of appeal. It had never, ever been done before. So Republicans threatened the so-called nuclear option. We threatened that we would change the rules of the Senate so that we could work our will with 51 votes. Senator Reid said at the time that would be the end of the Senate, and he wrote that in his book called The Good Fight in 2007. It is the most eloquent statement that I have heard about why changing the rules of the Senate to give a majority the right to do anything it wants with 51 votes is a bad idea. I'd like to read just a few sentences from Senator Reid's book, The Good Fight, written in 2007. Senator Frist, he wrote, who was majority leader, had decided to pursue a rules change that would kill the filibuster for judicial nominations. Sounds familiar. And once you opened the Pandora's box, Senator Reid said, it was just a matter of time before a Senate leader who couldn't get his way on something, couldn't get his way on something, moved to eliminate the filibuster for regular business as well. And that, simply put, would be the end of the United States Senate. Senator Reid continued, it's the genius of the founders that they conceived the Senate as a solution to the small state, big state problem. And central to that solution was the protection of the rights of the minority. A filibuster is the minority's way of not allowing the majority to shut off debate. And without robust debate, the Senate is crippled. Such a move would transform the body into an institution that looked like the House of Representatives where everything passes with a simple majority. Senator Reid continues, and it would tamper dangerously with the Senate's advise and consent function as enshrined in the Constitution. If even the most controversial nominee could simply be rubber stamped by a simple majority, advise and consent would be gutted. Trent Lott of Mississippi knew what he was talking about, Senator Reid said in 2007, when he coined the name for what they were doing, the nuclear weapon. Just one more paragraph. But that was their point. They knew 
If they trifled with the basic framework of the Senate like that, it would be nuclear. They knew that it would be a very radical thing to do. They knew it would shut the Senate down. And there will come a time when we will be gone. This is Senator Reid talking. There will come a time when we will all be gone and the institutions that we now serve will be run by men and women not yet living. And those institutions will either function well because we've taken care of them or they'll be in disarray and someone else's problem to solve. Well, because the Republicans couldn't get their way of nominating some radical judges confirmed to the federal bench, they were threatening to change the Senate so fundamentally that it would never be the same again. In a fit of partisan fury, they were trying to blow up the Senate. This is Senator Reid talking. Senate rules could only be changed by two thirds vote of the Senate or 67 senators. The Republicans were going to do it illegally with a simple majority of 51 Vice President Cheney was prepared to override the Senate parliamentarian, future generations be damned. Those are the words of the distinguished senator from Nevada in 2007, eloquently explaining why this body is so different than the House of Representatives. And I would ask consent not only to include those remarks, but several more pages from Senator Reid's excellent seventh chapter entitled The Nuclear Option in his book from 2007. Without objection. And finally, and third, Mr. President, if the Democrats can turn the Senate into a place where a majority of 51 can do anything they want, soon a majority of 51 Republicans are going to figure out the same thing to do. And after 2014, some observers have said we might even be in the majority. Senator McConnell might be the Republican leader and the majority leader. Maybe we'll even have a Republican president. So preparing for that opportunity, I would like to suggest the 10 items, briefly, that I would like to see on an agenda if we Republicans are able to pass anything we want with 51 votes, as the majority leader has suggested. Number one, repeal Obamacare. Number two, S2, that'd be the second bill. If I were the leader, I would put, I would put up Pell Grants for kids. You know, GI Bill for veterans, Pell Grants, they follow the students to the colleges of they, their choice, creating opportunity in the best colleges in the world, why don't we do the same thing for students in kindergarten through the 12th grade, take the 60 billion we spend, create a voucher for 25 million middle and low income children. It would be $2,200 for each one of them, just the money we now spend, let it follow them to, the, to the, any school they choose to attend, any accredited school, public or private. Number three on my list, complete Yucca Mountain. I've spoken often, often of the importance of nuclear energy to our country. It provides 20% of all our electricity, 60% of our clean electricity for those concerned about climate change and clean air. Since 2010, the majority leader has stalled the nuclear waste repository in Nevada. That jeopardizes our 100 reactors. That jeopardizes our source of 60% of our clean electricity. If we had 51 votes in the Senate, we could direct the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to issue a license, we could direct the Department of Energy to build Yucca Mountain, and we could fund the money to do it. Now, the junior senator from Nevada who shares Senator Reid's opposition to that said something about this recently. The day is gonna come that either he's here or not, that's the majority leader, or the Republicans take control and it's a 50 vote threshold. These kinds of issues are the ones that concern me the most, said Senator Heller. When you're from a small state, you need as many arrows in your quiver as possible to fight back on some of these issues that you can be overtaken by. And frankly, the 60 vote threshold is what has protected and saved Nevada in the past. I'd ask consent to include Senator Heller's comments. Without objection. Mr. President, of all the Democrats who voted once upon a time, for completing Yucca Mountain were to do so again, we could get a bipartisan majority of 51 votes today in the United States Senate to complete Yucca Mountain. So make no mistake, a vote to end the filibuster is a vote to complete Yucca Mountain. Now here's the rest of my list, I'll do it quickly, that I would suggest to the Republican leader, if he were majority leader, is priorities for Senate where we could pass anything we wanted with 51 votes. 
make the Consumer Protection Bureau accountable to Congress. That'd be number four. Number five, drill in Anwar and build the Keystone Pipeline. Number six, fix the debt. Really ought to be number one. But Senator Corker and I have a $1 trillion reform of entitlement programs that would put us on the road toward fixing the debt. Number seven, right to work for every state. We'd re reverse the presumption, create a presumption of freedom, giving workers in every state the right to work. States would have the right to opt out, to insist on forced unionism, just the reverse of what we have today. No EPA regulation of greenhouse gases. And finally, repeal Davis-Bacon, save taxpayers billions by ending the federal mandate on contractors. Now, Mr. President, the majority, the, the Republican leader and I have plenty of creative colleagues. They'll have their own top 10 lists. And when word gets around on our side of the aisle that the United States Senate will be like the House of Representatives and a train can run through it without anyone slowing it down, there'll be a lot of my colleagues with their own ideas about adding a lot of cars to that freight train. Mr. President, John, Ad John Meacham's book about Thomas Jefferson is one I've been reading. He reports a conversation between uh, John Adams and Jefferson on, in 1798. Adams said, no republic could ever last which has not had a Senate, strong enough to bear up against all the popular storms and passions. Trusting a popular assembly for the preservation of our liber liberties is implausible. Alexis de Tocqueville, traveling our country in the 1830s, saw only two great threats for our young democracy. One was Russia. One was the tyranny of the majority. And finally, as the Republican leaders so well st stated, there's no excuse here for all this talk. The Democrats are manufacturing a crisis. To suggest that Republicans are holding things up unnecessarily is absolute nonsense. In fact, over the last to Congresses, we've made it easier for any president to have his or her nomination secured. The Washington Post on March 18, Congressional Research Service on March 23rd said that President Obama's nominations for cabinet are moving through the Senate at least as rapidly as his two predecessors. Since then, the Secretary of Energy has been confirmed 97 to nothing. There may be another three up this week. And then as the Republican leader said, look at the executive calendar. Only three district judges waiting. As for filibusters, according to the Senate historian, the number of Supreme Court justices who've been denied their seats by filibuster is zero. The only possible exception, Zabe Fortas and Lyndon Johnson engineered a 45-43 vote so he could hold his head up while he continued to serve on the court. The number of cabinet members who've been denied their seats by filibuster in the history of the Senate is Zero. The number of district judges who've been denied their seats by filibuster in the history of the Senate is zero. This is according to the Senate historian and the Congressional Research Service. So what are they talking about? I know what they're talking about. They're talking about circuit judges. That's the only exception. And why is it an exception? It's because in the, in, 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 when I came to the Senate 10 years ago, the Democrats broke historical precedent and blocked five distinguished judges of President Bush by a filibuster. Republicans have returned the favor and blocked two of President Obama's by a filibuster, which should be a lesson for the future who, to those who want to change the rules. There, about half the Senate, Mr. President, is in its first term. They may not know about the majority leader's statements in 2007. They may not know about the history of the Senate. They may have heard all these conflicting facts and not having the right facts. What I've given you is what the Senate historian and Congressional Research Service says is the facts. Of course, there have been delays. My own nomination was delayed 87 days by a Democratic senator. I didn't try to change the rules of the Senate. President Mises' nomination, uh, President Reagan's nomination of Ed Meese was delayed a year by a Democratic Senate. And no one has ever disputed our right in the Senate regardless of who was in charge, to use our constitutional duty of advise and consent to delay and examine, sometimes to cause nominations to be withdrawn, or even to defeat nominees by a majority vote. And yes, some sub-cabinet members 
have been denied their seats by a filibuster. The Democrats denied John Bolton his post on the United Nations. And Senator Warren Rudman told me the story of how the Democratic senator from New Hampshire blocked his nomination by a secret hold. Nobody knew what was happening. And I asked Senator Rudman what he did about it. He said, I, run against, I ran against the so-and-so in the next election, and I beat him. And that's how Rudman got to the Senate. So in summary, Mr. President, the idea that we have a crisis of nominations is absolute, complete nonsense, totally unsupported by the facts. It should be embarrassing to my friends on the other side to even bring it up. They should be congratulating us for helping to make it easier for any president to move nominations through. And the advice and consent is a constitutional prerogative that both bodies have always defended. So there are three reasons why the majority leader will not turn the Senate into a place where a majority of 51 can do anything it wants, in my judgment. One, he said he wouldn't, and senators keep their word. Two. He said the nuclear option would be the end of the Senate, and no majority leader wants written on his tombstone, he presided over the end of the United States Senate. And three, if Democrats turn the Senate into a place when 51 senators can do anything they want, it won't be long before Republicans do the same. And to be very specific, if Senator Reid and Democrats vote to allow a majority to do anything they want in the United States Senate and set that precedent, voting to end the filibuster will be a vote to complete Yucca Mountain. So Mr. President, I come today with respect to the Republican and the Democratic leader, and especially to this institution to say, let's end the threats, let's stop the nonsense, let's get back to work on immigration and the other important issues facing our country. I thank the President and I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Republican leader. I ask consent that the senator from Tennessee and I be allowed to engage in a colloquy. Please. Without objection. I want to uh, congratulate my friend from uh, Tennessee on a brilliant presentation about the history of the Senate and the current uh, manufactured uh, crisis that we face. Uh, and what I would, the only thing I would add just by way of reiterating the point my friend has already made, uh, you quoted Jefferson and Adams about the tyranny of the uh, majority, or was that uh, de Tocqueville? Washington, when provide, presiding over the Constitutional Convention, was, according to legend, asked, um, what will the Senate be like? He said, well, it'll be like this saucer under the teacup and the tea will slosh out of the cup down into the saucer and cool off. In other words, from the very beginning, it was anticipated by the wise men who wrote the Constitution that the Senate would be a place where things slowed down and were thought over. And that's been the tradition for a very long time throughout the history of our country. Until, until the First World War, it was not possible to stop a debate at all. Cloture was actually adopted by the Senate uh, in the late uh, teens of the previous century. And then lowered in the 70s to the current uh, two thirds. Looking at the history of our country, it's pretty clear to me the Senate has done exactly what Washington thought it would do. Slowed things down, moved them to the middle, and been a place where bipartisan compromise was by and large achieved, except in periods of time where either side had a very big majority, which of course our friends on the other side had in 2009 and 2010. The American people took a look at that, decided to issue a national restraining order and restored the kind of Senate they were more comfortable with that operates to use a football analogy sort of between metaphor between the 40 yard lines, so to speak, between the two 45 yard lines. It, there's not a doubt in my mind that if the majority breaks the rules of the Senate to change the rules of the Senate with regard to nominations, the next majority will do it for everything. And the Senator from Tennessee has pointed that out. I wouldn't be able to argue a year and a half from now if I were the majority leader to my colleagues that we shouldn't enact our legislative agenda with a simple 51 votes, having seen what the previous majority just did. I mean, there would be no rational basis for that. 
And so it's appropriate to talk about what our agenda would be. And I would be, of course, consulting with my colleagues on what our agenda would be, but I don't think there's any doubt that virtually every member of the Senate Republican Conference would think repealing Obamacare would be job one of a new Republican majority. And so I don't even have to guess what is likely to be the number one uh, priority, repealing Obamacare. The senator from Tennessee mentioned drilling in Anwar. There's been a majority in the Senate for quite some time, uh, both when the Democrats were in the majority and the Republicans were in the majority, to, to lift the ban against drilling in Anwar. I think that would certainly be on any top 10 uh, list that I was able to put together as majority leader. Uh, approving the Keystone Pipeline. We've gotten as many as 57 votes for that. We've gotten as many as 56 votes for Anwar. How about repealing the death tax? We've gotten as many as 57 votes back in 2006 to repeal the death tax entirely. There's a, uh, a new bill being introduced just this afternoon by our colleague Senator Thune from South Dakota to get rid of the death tax altogether, to get rid of the dilemma every American faces that he has to visit the IRS and the undertaker on the same day the government's final outrage. These are the kinds of priorities that, feel, that our members feel strongly about. And I think I would be hard pressed with a new majority, having just witnessed the way the Senate was changed with a simple majority by the current Democratic majority to argue that we should restrain ourselves from taking full advantage of this new Senate. From the country's point of view, it's a huge step in the wrong direction. And um, I'm not advocating that, but I'd be hard pressed to say to our members, precedent having been set, why should we confine it to nominations? Mr. President, I, I, I agree with the uh, Republican leader, and of course, uh, the distinguished majority leader agrees with you as well, because he said in his book in 2007, I read it, but I'll read it again, when talking about the Republican efforts in the, you know, several years ago, Republicans were so upset with actual obstructionism, as opposed to made up obstructionism, which is what we see here, but so upset that this is what Senator Reid said. If the majority leader pursues a rules change that would kill the filibuster for judicial nominations. And once you open that Pandora's box, it's just a matter of time before a Senate leader who couldn't get his way on something moved to eliminate the filibuster for regular business as well. And that, simply put, would be the end of the United States Senate. And what that means, it would be the Senate would be like the House. A freight train could run through it. I mean, people, many senators have not visited the House Rules Committee. I have. It's an interesting place. The Republicans can run the House by a single vote, but if you go up to the Rules Committee, and I'm sure the distinguished Republican leader's been there, there are nine chairs, nine members. How many Democrats do you suppose have those chairs? Four. How many uh, Republicans uh, 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 ha have those? No, I think it's more than that. Two to one plus one is, is the majority in the House, in the Rules Committee. But in the House of Representatives, whatever the majority wants to do, it can do. And so if we have a, if we have a body with 51 votes to make all the decisions, and if I and others are deeply concerned about the nuclear waste sitting around at some of these 100 reactors, we've got several of us on both sides of the aisle who are working on legislation like that, and we want it put in a repository that legally, uh, it, where it's supposed to be, we have 51 votes, if they all vote the way they voted before, to order the government to open Yucca Mountain and put the nuclear waste there. That's what you can do with 51 votes. So um, the way our government is designed, the House can order that, which they have, but the Senate hasn't because the majority leader's been able to make this body stop and think about whether it wanted to do. I may not like that result, but I prefer that process for the good of the country to give us time to, 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 to work, things, work things out. And hasn't it always been, I would ask the Republican leader, 
Hasn't it always been really the responsibility, maybe the chief responsibility of the Republican leader and the Democratic leader to preserve this institution? Newer senators may not know as much about it, may not have as long a view, but over, over the time you've been here, hasn't that been, I would ask through the chair to the, to the uh, Republican leader, hasn't that been the responsibility of the leaders of the Senate? I'd say to my friend from uh, Tennessee, absolutely right. I mean, th the one thing the two leaders have always agreed on is to protect the integrity of the institution. Yeah. And for those who may be observing this uh, colloquy, they probably wonder uh, why it's occurring. And I want to explain to our colleagues and to any others who may be watching why this colloquy is occurring. Senate Republicans are tired of the culture of intimidation. The culture of intimidation. Now we've seen it over in the executive branch with the IRS. And we've seen it at HHS with regard to Obamacare. This feeling that if you're in the majority, if you're not in the majority, you need to sit down and, and shut up and get out of the way. And that mentality, that arrogance of power has seeped into the Senate now. And the culture of intimidation is this. Do what I want to do, when I want to do it, or I'll break the rules of the Senate. Change the rules of the Senate by breaking the rules of the Senate. In other words, it's the intimidation, the threat that's been hanging over the Senate as an institution for the last few months that needs to come to an end. And so I believe that is why the Senator from Tennessee and myself would like the majority leader to answer the question, do you intend to keep your word? Senators shouldn't have to walk on eggshells around here afraid to exercise the rights that they have under the rules of the Senate. And there's no question that all senators have a lot of power in this body. This body operates on unanimous consent. That means if any one of the hundred want to deny that, it makes it hard. But that's the way the Senate's been for a very long time. I want the culture of intimidation by the majority here in the Senate to come to an end. And the way it can end is for the majority leader to say, my word is good. And we quit having this culture of intimidation hanging over the Senate for the next year and a half. President. Senator from Tennessee. I'd like to congratulate the Republican leader on his remarks, and it's important for those watching to know there, there are plenty of us here who know how the Senate is supposed to work, and we're doing that. You know, we, we passed a farm bill. We passed a water resources bill involving locks, dams, ports, in this country. We did that the way the Senate's supposed to work. We worked across party lines. We got a consensus, got more of the majority, and did it. We have eight senators who've come forward with an immigration bill. Tough issue, but we're working together to see if we can resolve that. I'm a part of a group of six or seven senators who are trying to lower student loans for 100% of students, not just 40%. But we're not trying to ram it through with 51 votes. We're trying to get a consensus. And then pass it, send it to the House, and hopefully they'll do it. When the great civil rights bills passed, they were a consensus and the country accepted them because they were important pieces of legislation. When the Republican leader and I were young and, and, and I was here, he was almost here, uh, that we saw Senator Dirksen and President Johnson work together to get a supermajority to say to the country, it's time to move ahead on civil rights. That's the way the Senate's supposed to work. And, and let's stop the threat, stop the intimidation, recognize the progress we've made, get back to work on immigration. Mr. Brown, I just want to conclude by thanking the Senator from Tennessee for a very, very impressive presentation and for his reminding us all of what makes the United States Senate great. I yield the floor.